Welcome to the first foundational episode of the Rheology podcast. Now you're probably thinking to yourself, what in the world is Rheology? Well, technically speaking, it's the study of Re, which may seem like a complex thing, but really it's kind of simple. So English speaking people like me and you, we use the letters R and D in front of just about any verb to completely change its meaning. Re means to go back and kind of do it again, like reconsider, reopen, reunite. Basically, it's a do-over. So more specifically here, we'll talk about the re when it applies to the Bible, God, Jesus, and Christianity. My name is Scott Johnson. I'm just a regular guy who has a personal relationship with God and has spent a lot of time professionally in Christian ministry. Now, I am not a trained theologian, and nor do I have degrees in theology or the Bible. I just simply came to a point in my life of wondering if there was more than what I was experiencing in the life of modern Christianity, and more specifically, the church. So in this inaugural episode, I'd like to share the beginning chapter of what hopefully will be a much bigger story that will unfold over the next several weeks and months. I'm a huge movie fan. I love movies. One of my favorite movie trilogies is the Matrix Trilogy. You know, the thought that the reality that we think we're living in is actually a lie, that is trippy, no doubt, for sure. But it's also it's also powerful. You know, a thought like that simply makes me stop and think. It makes me think about what I'm doing and how I'm doing it. It's kind of like a personal inventory. You know, when we stop to think, we release a potential power to live a much more effective life. Today's podcast episode will be addressing that very same idea in today's world of modern-day Christianity. So, like Morpheus, I stand here before you with a blue pill in one hand and a red pill in the other. Interested in seeing how deep the rabbit hole goes? Well then, take the red pill and join me on a 40-minute journey through history to uncover the truth about something that we take for granted every single day. Now, as I said before... I'm not a trained theologian, and nor do I have a degree in the Bible. But my life was changed at the age of 15 when a good friend of mine shared this incredible news of this guy named Jesus, of who he was and what he wanted with me. I started going with him to youth group events, and through that I found a belonging and a commonality that seemed to fit just exactly what I was searching for. After high school, I attended a Bible college. I went there for four and a half years, leaving with just one class shy of receiving a degree, but that didn't keep me from spending 14 years in full-time ministry and the majority of that working with kids and students. But in 2014, I left student ministry behind for a chance to help plant a church and with the goal of planting my own church later on down the road. And now this is kind of where my journey of what I call conviction began. So in student ministry, we had, we just had purpose. We had a goal. You know, our our purpose was to make disciples out of teenagers. I dedicated my life to befriend them, to love them, to disciple them. And I set up a team of adults to do the very same thing right along with me. When I got into church planning, though, I, I started to realize that our main focus was spent on Sunday morning. I mean, our meetings were spent discussing it for hours sometimes. The majority of our money went to fund it. We kind of made it the front door to what we were doing, and actually probably the only door. And in so doing that, we kind of made it seem like it was the pinnacle of a Christian's experience. But after only one year, I was let go due to funding issues, and so I moved on. God built a graphic design business for me, and I've been doing that ever since. But that's not to say that I didn't have encounters with Sunday Morning Ministries Church. I did. I actually was a part-time staff on one new church, a part-time on another, and yet a full-time staff on yet another. And then I've worked with several churches via my business. Still, though, I experienced the same thing. You know, I... I experienced this idea that churches were just being so, so focused on one thing, the Sunday morning service. 
I mean, even in our family's expedition, you know, our hunt to find a place to go on Sunday mornings, we continued to run into the same thing over and over and over. It was just different people, different locations, and, and a different brand. But the message seemed to be the same. Above all, make sure you come to church. And so the seed of conviction that was planted in me earlier was starting to sprout and grow. I just couldn't help but feel that something was seriously lacking in the main avenue of the church of modern Christianity. I mean, you know, I'm looking at my Bible and I'm reading about those early Christians and I'm comparing that with what we typically do on a weekly basis in our culture. And I can't help to see that something's missing. So in late 2011, I started down a road of trying to answer that question I posed earlier. Is there more than what I had experienced in church ministry and probably more specifically with the actual concept of church? Now, this questioning, as I kind of alluded to earlier, wasn't really prominent during my years of student ministry. I, I, I mean, I did see it from a distance and did experience it from a distance, but I didn't experience it firsthand, mainly because we were so involved in, in just doing ministry. We were, we were involved in a ministry that had a purpose and a goal, and we were busy doing it. But it was only after those years of church ministry that I started to take a step way back and a real hard, rational look out this thing that we called church. Some of the questions that surrounded that thought were questions like, you know, why are we doing what we're doing? Why are we as ministers doing what we're doing as paid full-time positions? And probably most importantly, was this what Jesus had in mind all along? I really doubted it. Well, I'm a researcher at heart, and so when you start questioning these types of things, you inevitably start researching which begins with looking at what's at the very center of that particular issue. And in this case, it was the concept of church. You know, I started going to church as a teen. I went to college and I went to church during the week at chapel and then went to church on the weekend and I professionally worked for a church. I mean, church was centered as the most important thing in a Christian's life. And it was a globally accepted concept. Well, my question is, where did it come from? And maybe more specifically, where did this word church come from? I mean, it's a funny word, church, you know? The English language, it gets accused of being one of the hardest languages to learn, mainly because of the plurality of meanings of certain words. I mean, we have words like homophones and homographs. Now, a homophone are words that sound the same, but they have different meanings and they're spelled differently. Like the words two, two, and two. There, there, and there, and not to sound too much like in sync, but by, by, and by. And we still struggle with when to use those words. I mean, shoot, I see it on Facebook all the time. People don't know when to use the word there, the word there, the word there. It's confusing. And then we have homographs. Homographs are words that they are spelled the same. They look identically, but they sound differently. When pronounced and they have different meanings like the word bass and bass like the word bow and bow and the word wind and wind the word church has become a homograph we're all a little bit confused about its true definition especially when we continually reference it in three different ways i mean what does it mean is it a building is it a service is it a people and in our modern, modern culture, I, I think the answer is actually yes. I think we literally believe that it is all three, but yet different somehow. It's almost as puzzling as the nature of the Trinity. I have heard pastors and ministers stand from the stage on Sunday morning declaring all three definitions within the same few minutes, the same paragraph or two. And they say things like, our church needs new carpet. Or, hey, bring a friend to church next month. And then, don't forget, you are the church. It's confusing. But the big question would be, was this the intent of Jesus? Was this word meant to mean these things? And was this even the word that he used? So Matthew 16, 18, one of the first places we see the word church in the New Testament. This is where I began. And Jesus is talking with his disciples. They've just been out doing their thing. And he wants to know, what are people saying? What's the word on the street? What do they think of me? And by the way, what do you guys think? And of course, Peter says, you're, the, you're Jesus. 
You're the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus then says, upon that kind of belief, that statement of belief and that statement of faith, on, on, on that, he says, I will build, and here it is in our Bibles in English, I will build my church. Hmm. So, I went deeper. When looking at scripture, it's always smart to start with two areas. The first one would be the setting. We call it the context, right? What's going on? Who's involved? Where are they? And what's the culture like? A lot of times we pull scriptures completely out of the setting, out of its context, and we put it into our setting in America in the year 2017. And we, we read it and we define it in those terms and we typically get it wrong. So what's the context? And then the second thing would be, what was the original language it's written in? So the Old Testament is written in Hebrew. The New Testament is written in Greek. So in this case, I'm looking at this English word in my Bible, church. The word church is actually a, from a German word. And it means house of the Lord. So this English word was chosen to represent a Greek word. And here, this Greek word is ekklesia. Now, it's actually made of two words, really. The first word is ek, which means out from or out to. And kaleo means to call. So literally translated, ekklesia means calling out from or calling out to. Now, ecclesia is not a church word. It wasn't created for religious purposes. I mean, it was an everyday word or phrase used in the first century living in Palestine area. It was adopted, kind of created by the Greeks, adopted by the Romans after when they took over. And since they took, had a big monster empire, it was kind of adopted through all types of people, even Hebrew people living around Jesus' time. And this phrase is typically is attached to a group of people either a crowd receiving official news or a civilian representatives. So in the first instance, when an official decree was made, let's say Rome, for instance, made a new law. And that law had to be told to every person, every civilian in the population in the empire, to the regular folk living here, there, and everywhere. Someone was commissioned with the task of getting that word out. And so that person might then split it up into other people, and those people would take it to certain regions, and then those people would take it to certain towns or cities or all the way down to the smallest village. And that person would go into the smallest village with their good news of the day from the emperor, from the empire. The good news, which is, by the way, where we get the, the word gospel, is ready to tell this great news, this great news from the empire. And the civilians need to hear it. So he would call those people out from their homes to congregate so he could tell them this good news. So he called the ecclesia out so he could tell them the gospel. Hmm, that sounds familiar somewhere. So that's one instance. The other instance is this. That the phrase can be found in basically Acts chapter 19. We got Paul, right? Paul was a big Christian guy. He had missionary journeys here, there, and everywhere. His heart was really Rome. He was in, found in all kinds of places throughout Rome. He had some companions with him in Acts chapter 19. This guy named Gaius and Aristocrus. Well, they were put in front of an assembly of civilians and then some officials gathered and people around because they wanted to know what in the world Paul was doing, what his teachings were all about. They thought, man, he's, he's kind of teaching bad stuff about, you know, uh, some of our gods around here and that they're not true actually which is kind of what he was doing we want to hear the, we, we, we need to know what's going on we need an organized meeting here we need we need some uh, some of our of official representatives to gather some civilians around so we can do this thing the right way we want to hear from these guys and so the people who are gathered were are called the ecclesia but the people who did the gathering they were called the ecclesia too and so not only was it just a term for calling people out, but it was also a group of people who were called out to do a specific task. And, and, and in this situation, it was these official civilians. There was a term for a group of people who were called out of their everyday lives to represent both the government and to represent the everyday person. They were kind of like the go-between. 
They were both the voice of the people and the voice of the government. They made sure that people were taken care of, that no one slipped through the cracks, that needs were met, and that, that everything ran smoothly. They were movers and shakers, even though they didn't get paid for their position, nor they'd get fame from it or power. There was a position of service. Yet they were in the very mix of making a real difference in real people. Hence the philosophy of the ecclesia. Now, this one grammatical form of this ecclesia is, is used 115 times in the New Testament. We see it 115 times. Now, get this, okay? Get this. 112 times, for some reason, it's translated as church, a.k.a. house of the Lord, referring to a building, an institution. But only three times of the 115 times, as we see it right here in Acts 19, it's been translated as assembly or congregation, a.k.a. people called out. Why? Same word translated two completely different ways. Why? I mean, could this simply just be an error? I mean, surely this hasn't been done on purpose, is it? But that, of course, then took me even deeper. I, I wanted to know what's going on here. Now, I've always looked at, as I said before, these early Christians and how, you know, they met in homes, they shared meals, they prayed together, they took care of each other and others around them. But they were also influencers. They were movers and agents of change. They completely turned the capital city of Judaism, Jerusalem, completely turned it upside down in only a year. And then the rest of the known world in only a few short years. How did this uneducated unqualified group of people do this. They didn't go to seminary. They didn't have degrees. They weren't full-time pastors. They didn't have a big building, a cool band, a big-time speaker, nor did they have a big-time budget or marketing. But yet somehow, despite being hunted down, persecuted, and executed, they grew. And not just grew, they thrived and this people movement exploded. And I look at that in my Bible, and then I look up from it, and I take a quick inventory of what we've got going on today in the Christian culture, and I'm like, what happened? I mean, what happened? We went from a thriving, unstoppable organism to an almost irrelevant organization that really doesn't do much except for, for itself. And hasn't really done much in several hundred years. Where did it all start to go wrong? Maybe, just maybe it had to do with, with, with something with the differences of these two words, with church and ecclesia. So let's get into the DeLorean here. Well, I mean, let's punch the numbers in for uh, 323 AD and we'll engage the flux capacitor. And next thing you know, we see this guy named Constantine. Constantine was an emperor of Rome from 323 to 337. And Constantine was born into the Roman environment of persecution of Christians. As I said before, 300 years, Christianity had just exploded. A people movement that was unstoppable. And Rome was, quite honestly, a big empire. And had a lot of influence and wanted to keep that influence and keep that power. Where Christianity started to break that up and it was seen as a as a threat to the empire. And so we have all these emperors through the years who's, you know, it was, they were adamant. They, it was their own personal vendetta to kill Christianity and to kill Christianity by killing Christians. We got guys like Nero and Decius. But Constantine was actually born into a family that was, that was sympathetic to the Christian movement. His dad and his, and his family were pretty much visionary type of people. They kind of seen it, saw it as, as more of the wave of the future. So Constantine was uh, kind of groomed to be the new emperor, and in 311 AD, he marches his small band of troops against a the Roman emperor of the West, because Rome was kind of split into two empires. And right before he goes to invade, he sleeps one night, and he says he has this epiphany, this dream that God says, listen, if you will put the cross before your troops, you will be guaranteed a victory. And so he wakes up and he gathers his generals and officers and says, 
Let's paint these crosses on all the shields of all of our soldiers. The cross would become the known as the Chiro Cross. And you guessed it, they overthrew a much bigger army. Not just overthrew them, but the old emperor and his group, they were running like with the dog between his, with its tail between its legs, just trying to get the heck out of there. They were routed. Matter of fact, the old emperor got ran over by his own troops and knocked him into a river, and because he had his ar- armor on, it he drowned. And so, Constantine becomes the Western emperor in 311, and in 12 years later, in 323, he becomes the emperor of all of Rome. He reunites Rome. Now, Constantine did some really good things. He also let's not let's not get too carried away here. Constantine was kind of a you know he he was one of those type of emperors still he still did some some really horrible bad things um he still had people killed he still did some stuff like that but what he did do and this is whether it's good or bad that could be for you to judge but he did stop the persecution of christians he did stop the persecution of christians unfortunately the pendulum swung way too far over. And what he ended up doing is he paved the way for an organized religion and basically took it back to a temple-like structure with a centralized place for worship. And officials, bishops, priests were the ones that were charged with handling people and handling the new formed organization. And even later in 381 AD, Christianity was officially declared the official Roman Empire religion. And so the institution begins and the organism, the people movement, it ends. Basically, we went back to the temple model of religion, something that Jesus came, taught, and died to move away from. But if we flash forward uh, about a thousand years or so into the early 16th century, we got this dude named William Tyndale. William Tyndale is an English priest in the Church of England. He's making his way up the ranks. Really, really smart guy, a genius. He spoke eight languages like a second language. I mean, literally spoke and, no- and read those languages as well as he did English. He actually helped refine the English language. He studied at Oxford and Cambridge. A smart dude. Well, something in uh, Tyndall changed. That is, he was on cruise control on his way up to uh, being a, a big shot. He read a, a, um, a, a new translation, a new Greek translation, New Testament, from a guy named Erasmus, who was a Dutch Catholic priest, who thought differently. And he saw this word ecclesia and that the translation was was off that, that, that basically we've been saying church this whole time and it's not really that and Erasmus held this idea and belief that every person had the right to read the Bible in their own language and this inspired Tyndall obviously but it's was, it was extremely controversial I mean the the Bible had an official language as far as the Church of England and Rome was concerned, and that was Latin. Every Bible that would ever be printed in England would be officially in the language of Latin, which the only people that spoke Latin were the highly educated, so it left almost everybody else completely in the dark. If you're just a regular little dude working in the fields, you didn't know Latin. You just kind of had to trust that the priest was being honest with what was written what was written and what he was saying. So this sparked a passion in Tyndall. He wanted to translate the original Greek into English for the very, very first time. I mean, the Gutenberg Bible had just been printed in 1456 in German. And he knew this is exactly what God was calling him to do. So he set out to do it. Unfortunately, he he, he, he found obstacles every step of the way. He was rejected by all kinds of authorities and bishops and friends of his. They said it was heresy. He should forget about it, move on with his life. If not, he could be arrested. He could be imprisoned. He could be killed. But this would not deter Tyndall at all. He had a passion here and he had to do it. He felt like this was what God was telling him to do with his life. 
So he knew he couldn't do it in England. He needed to move to a more friendly environment. And so he moved to Germany to be able to print without fear of arrest or execution. And in his translation, he made sure to make ecclesia a word that was very different. And back to its original meaning, which was assembly or congregation. It took the focus off of the church, the house of the Lord, or the institution, and he put it in its rightful spot, people. And as you can imagine, this went against the motives and strategy of the king of England at the time, who was Henry VIII, and that of the pope, and that of the church. They wanted to continue to have control over their subjects instead of putting that control into their subjects' hands. But he printed this, and it became hugely popular. It was actually the size of like your palm of your hand. It was a small Bible. You could fit in everybody's, I mean, your pocket. You could take it with you. If someone's out in the field, they could stop. They could read in their own language. It was wildly, wildly popular. But of course, this really ticked off the King of England, the church, the Pope, very much ticked them off. And so the King of England sought out to hunt him down, tried to find Tyndall, burn all the Bibles that were printed, the New Testaments, get them off of the streets, find him, and deal with him. Finally, after evading them for a long time, Tyndall was caught. A friend of his basically turned him in. He was caught, sent back to England. He was imprisoned for over a year. And finally, in 1536, in public, he was strangled to death. And then his body was burned at the stake. Even Tyndall's, some of Tyndall's friends and companions were imprisoned. Some of them beaten, some of them killed. Some of them, they had their kids taken away from them and sent to orphanages. <laughs> all for translating and printing the New Testament in English and doing so correctly? Wow. Tyndall was only 42 years old. Ironically, just a couple years later, one of Henry VIII's wives was a huge fan of the Tyndall New Testament. And I guess he just kind of thought to himself, well, if you can't beat him, join him. And so he commissioned a new Bible to be printed and in, translated into English. It would be the official version of the church. Basically saying this is the only Bible you can have. You can't have any other Bible. And of course, he took the word ecclesia and retranslated it back to the word church along with some other words like agape and some other words. And there's where we have the first official English Bible of the English church called the Great Bible, 1539. But then there's again this other guy, his name is, his name is uh, Miles Coverdale, and he was a contemporary and right-hand man of Tyndale. He helped him out. He helped him get this New Testament printed. A few years later, he was thinking, man, we need to, we need to get this, we need to do the whole Bible. And so he and a group of guys some other reformers, they came out and said, we are going to use Tyndall's New Testament as our basis or foundation, and we're going to do the whole Bible. And so in 1576, they did the whole Bible called the Geneva Bible. And it was actually kind of more, not just English, but kind of more of layman's terms, kind of like a we have the modern day message Bible. That's why they called it the Pilgrim's Bible, because, you know, it was just every man's Bible. It changed, obviously, Ecclesia back to what it's supposed to be, people, assembly, congregation. It changed back some of the other words as well. And as you can imagine, once again, wildly, wildly, wildly popular. Huge, hugely popular. And, of course, it ticked off the king. It ticked off the church. It ticked off the pope. And so in 1604, this new king on the block, and I don't know, you may have heard of his name before. Let's see, uh, James. He hated the Geneva Bible. He hated the Reformers, mainly because it took power away from him and gave it to the people. And so he set up his own group once again to translate and print a new official Bible to replace the Great Bible. 
but he had conditions. And obviously, as you can probably guess, ecclesia would be changed back to the word church, institution, building. And they printed it, the King James Bible. You may have heard of it before. They even banned the Geneva Bible reprints. They couldn't ever kill the Geneva Bible because it was so popular. It was snuck around. And matter of fact, fun little tidbit here, the Geneva Bible was the first Bible in America aboard the Mayflower. So after all of this research that I did, I was kind of left in shock. And I've been using this word church, thinking it was what Jesus died for this whole time. And the reality is, it was a word purposefully used by an institution to keep a way of life in order and in check and to keep people in order, to keep control over people and not to free them. To be honest with you, I felt a bit stupid. The part that leaves me standing and completely shaking my head is that even though I did not graduate Bible college, I did receive an education. I sat under some pretty smart guys who spent a lot of money and a lot of time learning about the Bible. But not once did I hear anything about what I just shared with you. And obviously, you don't have to be a scholar to figure these truths out. I mean, I had books and the internet, basically history. It didn't take too long for me to realize that we're probably way off of what Jesus had in mind. And that even through the great spiritual reformation of those times, Eventually, tradition and principle just kind of won won out. We just slipped right back into cruise control. So, now we flash forward 500-ish or 400-ish years, and the word church is ingrained into our religious culture and lifestyle. And like I said before, it's globally accepted. But it's very, very apparent that the word has watered down the true definition of the original word Jesus used to describe what he had in mind to build in Matthew 16, 18. Jesus used the word ecclesia on purpose because it was the closest modern idea that fit what he had come to build, a people movement. A people movement that was directly involved in the lives of people. (laughs) They were difference makers. They took care of each other and of the needs of everyone they came into contact with. They turned cities and empires upside down. I mean, that's the same power that drew me to God in the first place. My friend across the street lived out that idea of ecclesia, and I could not help but notice. It changed me. But unfortunately, that's not what I came to experience in full-time church ministry. And you know a sad part? A sad part is that we'll defend the church tooth and nail. We'll say things like Christ died for the church. But we don't say those things from an educated position. We say them more based upon tradition and principle. We're just repeating what we've, what we've heard. We have been lured asleep to just being okay with what we do on a weekly basis and what it means to follow Jesus. I have been told before, Scott, you're just going to get have to get used to it. That's just the way it is. Basically, if we just go to church, it rest is gravy. We don't have to worry about anything else just as long as we're there. When people meet me and talk about God, obviously the first question asked is, where do you go to church? Church has become the thermometer, the gauge of, of our spiritual lives. I mean, if Jesus meant that he was going to build another temple that we should just attend why would he use the word ecclesia and 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 actually why would god even send him in the first place i mean there already was a temple it's probably because what god had in mind was a personal relationship with his children he would build the temple inside of each of them and would do so through the sacrifices of his own son the messiah jesus That is what is missing. I mean, we all know Jesus died for our individual sins and that he's our personal savior. We just don't know what to do with it after that, except to come together in a building on Sunday morning and have church. 
Now, I want you to listen very carefully because I want to make sure anyone and everyone who is listening to this podcast episode knows what I am saying and what I am not saying. So I am not saying that getting together with other Christians on a Sunday morning in a building, listening to four songs from a band, and then listening to the newest sermon series from a speaker for 40 minutes is a bad thing. It's not. It's not a bad thing. Matter of fact, it could be a very good thing, especially if we break out of this model that we're in and do something different. It'd be it'd be great. If you want to go to a service on Sunday morning, that's absolutely fine. There's nothing wrong with that. But what I am saying, though, is that it isn't the main thing. Actually, it's a small piece of a much bigger puzzle. It is not the ecclesia. It is just one potential thing that the ecclesia can do out of a variety of lots of things. Now, some will want to scream at me, what about not forsaking the assembly? Well, first of all, those of you who just want to say those things that you've, you know, repeat what you've heard, that's, that's uh, found in Hebrews 10, 25. And the funny thing is the word assembly there in the Greek is not ecclesia. It's actually a word that's closely related to the word synagogue. It was a word that meant people who gathered together for some specific purpose, whether it is to teach or pray, or sing, or eat a meal, or comfort each other, or play, or etc. I mean, do I have to go to a building on Sunday morning from 10 to 11.15 to achieve this? No. There's nothing wrong with doing that, but I don't have to do that in order to achieve that. I can do that in my friend's house. I can do that on my lunch break. I can do that online via an Xbox party chat. I believe that's exactly what Jesus had in mind. This thing, Ecclesia, it's not defined by its building. It's not defined by its worship service or its particular brand. And it's definitely not defined by the word church. And my relationship with Jesus is not at stake if I don't go to church. The main thing that I am saying is that what Jesus had in mind to build and what flourished for 300 years was a people movement, a people movement that incorporated each member of the body of the Christ living out this philosophy of ecclesia on an everyday basis. I mean, I've come to the same conclusion that William Tyndall did a few hundred years ago. I'm not fond of the word church either. We either get rid of it completely, which it's not going to happen, or we use it to just define what happens on Sunday morning meetings. That's fine. But it's not the body of the Christ. It's not the ecclesia. If we do either of those, I believe it'll start putting things into perspective. And it'll put Christians on the right track. And we can start to teach the truth of what Jesus did come to build. And we can be free to live out this lifestyle in our everyday, ordinary lives, engaging everyday, ordinary people. That is where the true life change power that grows and thrives and explodes beyond our control resides right there not necessarily in just an hour and a half service. So I would love to challenge you to not just keep on going through your Christian life on cruise control. Don't wake up every day with blinders on thinking someone else will figure it out for you. Reology is about stopping what you're doing and thinking about why you're doing it. It's a do-over. Let's do just that. Stop and think. Hey, don't take my word for it. It's history. It's out there for everyone to learn. If you've been having, though, those same thoughts that I had for a while, you know, the thoughts of, is there something else? And what's missing here? I would like to encourage you to be willing to rethink, research, and rediscover the mysteries of God, the life of Jesus, and the purpose 
of the ecclesia. But just remember that it all starts with a willing spirit to stop and think. If you spend any time learning about this Jesus in any of the four books dedicated to his life in the Bible, Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John, you'll quickly see that his message revolved around this very mindset. Stop and think. Hey, thanks for your time. We'll be back next episode with my friend Darren Martin discussing the truths of Christianity that you may never have known before. They may sound crazy, but true. See ya.